honor and privilege to introduce you to Marshall So, our special guest speaker at Humboldt from New York University, who in a moment will be delivering her talk, Final Frontier, Heritage Villages, Collective Memory, and Urban Futures. Professor Marsha So is a member of the Cinema and Media Studies faculty at York, and has had a, an expansive career not only as a scholar of media studies, but also as a world-renowned art curator and an active participant, participant in the technological advancement of film production practices in the greater Toronto area and abroad. In her 2005 book, Marshall McLuhan, Cosmic Media, she offered a comprehensive reappraisal of over 40 years of McLuhan's cultural theory and looked at his revolutionary contributions in light of the technological shifts we've observed so far in the 21st century. In 2007, alongside fellow faculty members John Grayson and Caitlin Fisher, Professor Marsh so founded York's Future Cinema Lab, reiterating her commitment to investigating new models for constructing narratives in, in emergent media. For myself, as both a maker of 3D video and as a scholar with interest in stereoscopic technologies, Professor, Professor Marcia So's recent research into the history and future of 3D cinema is particularly exciting and inspiring. She is an active member of the 3D Film Innovation, uh, Film Innovation Consortium, which is a project that brings together scientists, filmmakers, and industry leaders intent to bridge research and stereoscopic technologies and perception with the development of new 3D film production languages. This York initiation also yielded the first Toronto International Stereoscopic 3D Conference, which itself yielded 3D Cinema and Beyond, one of my favorite issues of Public Journal, a publication for which Mar Professor Marcia So has been a regular editor, and for which she has contributed articles on topics such as Women's Liberation from Quebec, a comparison of the film scenes in New York, Paris, and, and Toronto, and a look at Toronto's landmark alternative screening venue, Cinecycle, which she sees as a model for the importance of a material screening place where history and traditions are able to accumulate. This is but a small taste of the breadth of her output in an extremely active last three decades, but I hope it begins to illustrate her invaluable commitment to the intertwined relationship between media and the geographical and architectural context in which it is presented. Since 2000, her research has become more deeply invested in urban spaces in cities, and in particular suburbs and edge cities, in grappling with communities that exist at the margins of metropolitan spaces. She has been able to help us come to terms with the ways in which disparate communities might come together and coexist. Among the cities she's investigated are Berlin, Havana, Helsinki, Montreal, and of course Toronto. In acknowledging Toronto as a world-class city, one that needs to protect its disappearing public spaces. She has utilized her curatorial expertise to take experimental and innovative approaches to public art. Having produced over a dozen large and small-scale public art exhibitions, she has been constantly exploring and discovering new ways to activate and re-enable these endangered spaces before they are able to vanish. For her most recent curatorial endeavor, the exhibition Landslide Possible Futures, Professor Marcia So commissioned three dozen artists to reimagine the historical and ecological terrain of Markham, Ontario. She asked the artists to draw thousands of local historical artifacts and to work in dialogue, in dialogue with the 30 historic buildings and dwellings that make up the Markham Museum's historic heritage village. The, re the resulting exhibition offered a diversity of media technologies ranging from digital diaries to 3D projections and filled the Markham Museum's 25-acre space for three weeks last September and October. The exhibition has since traveled internationally and was showcased earlier this year in the Canadian Pavilion at the Vice City Biennial, at, uh, sorry, the Vice, the Vice City Biennale of Urbanism and Architecture in Shenzhen, China. This afternoon, she will be contextualizing the landslide exhibition through the lens of Elizabeth Gross's conception of geoesthetics Feminist Ontology of Art and Philosophy of the Biosphere. With that, I ask that you please join me in welcoming her to the podium, Janine Marcisco. What, what I want to do today is try to look back over a, a number of exhibitions uh, that I've been involved with and 
look at the way that those exhibitions have changed, uh, really not as singular events, but really in relationship to uh, global practices within, within the art world. And so what I find interesting in reflecting back on these projects that started in the late 80s in Toronto um, is the way in which uh, they moved increasingly outward, out into the world. So um, out into the, the natural world too, not just the edge of, of cities, but, but really to think about uh, ecological politics. So the, it's, you know, um, I could present it in a way that it, it's very neat and tidy, that, you know, there was a master plan to, to these exhibitions over a 20-year period. But, of course, there, there isn't. And history, as we know, is, is very messy. But I, I think it's, it is very interesting to situate them in that way. And it's, it's useful for me to, to uh, as a means to think about them. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm... Uh, not really situating them in relationship to Elizabeth uh, Gross's thought, but I'm kind of bouncing off of Elizabeth Gross's uh, recent work uh, because to me she also uh, answers the question of, of where we should be going. And in particular, she poses a challenge to feminist theory to engage with the, with the biosphere. So she's a very, um, very important and inspirational interlocutor, but I'm not go going to do her work uh, really justice because I'm engaging more with, with, the, with the shows. But in a longer iteration and a more uh, fleshed out iteration of, of this paper, I think there are ways in which uh, the two could, could work together. Oh. The French sociologist Bruno Latour has talked about the incredible career that the term design has had from the surface feature in the hands of a not-so-serious profession that added features in the purview of a much more serious profession, like engineering, uh, like accounting, like science, design has been spreading continuously so that it increasingly matters to the very substance of production. What's more, design has been extended from the details of daily objects to cities, landscapes, nations, cultures, bodies, genes. Yet because of its history as a decorative art, design has a certain modesty, a concern with smaller details, with art and craft, that construction and building do not. Latour goes on to explain that designing is the antidote to founding, colonizing, establishing, or breaking with the past. It's an antidote to hubris and to the search for absolute certainty, absolute beginnings, and radical departures. This is so because design never works from scratch. Design builds upon the past in some way. It engages with what is already there. A designed object always foregrounds its materials. And in this way, it is deeply connected to the historical fabric of making. Surprisingly, there's a revolutionary aspect to design but not in the more traditional sense of the word. And Latour turns to Mao, the revolution has always to be revolutionized. Design provides a new set of attitudes that are revolutionizing the revolution. Quote, attitudes like modesty, care, precaution, skills, crafts, meanings, attention to details, careful conservations, artificiality, and ever-shifting transitory fashions. Latour tells us we have to be radical we have to be radically careful and carefully radical. In the context of the ecological crisis, he says, design comes at a time when there is much work to be done, namely, quote, the remaking of our collective life on Earth. The significance of design in the contemporary world is tied to the centrality of informatics, computing, mapping, in the daily activities of citizens in global cities around the world. It's tied to the fact that everything can be transformed in some way into information. And indeed, this is what inspired the computer designer Lev Manovich to name his latest book, Software Takes Command. Software, he writes, has become our interface to the world, to others, to our memory, to our imagination, a universal language through which the world speaks, a universal engine on which the world runs. 
Manovich's book is an homage to the 1948 book, Mechanization Takes Command, a Contribution to Anonymous History by the Swiss architectural historian Siegfried Gideon. In the same way that Gideon's book sought to excavate and analyze the forms of mechanization that helped to give shape to a new industrial society of the 19th and early 20th century, Manovich's book seeks to write a history of those computer programs that we take for granted. Uh, you know, PowerPoint, Word, uh, After Effects, Final Cut Pro, etc. And the value of his book can be found in this history of software, which is all too often invisible. So this, per this book is part of a relatively new software studies field that is, that is somewhat uneven, but certainly interesting in the way it's bringing a new materiality into our virtual worlds by giving them a, his a historical frame. Such endeavors are connected to, uh, to the new materialism, which is the subject of feminist philosopher Elizabeth Gross's book on art, territory, and chaos, as well as her book on becoming undone. She tells us new materialism provides us with a new understanding of the forces, both material and immaterial, that direct us into the future. Like Gideon, Gross believes that artists have a role to play in imagining the world in the way our worlds are dreamed, designed, and remembered. Gross reinvents a role for utopia, not simply the functional and spatial utopias of, uh, of architects like uh, Gideon or, uh, differently, uh, Le Corbusier, uh, but she, um, she essentially invents a new role for utopia, which is uh, to create uh, an idea of embodied utopia, which is, which is, uh, seems like an, an oxymoron since utopias are generally not embodied, but this is what she wants to propose, is this idea of an, an embodied utopia which makes room for the other, which makes room for multiplicity and for differences. Um, she also, as I was saying a few minutes ago, she really wants to make room bring feminist uh, theory and feminist philosophy in conversation with the bios. She wants to make room for the complexity of the world, for its material and political unfolding. A central tension in the process of planning capitalist cities is between ecology, the earthy environment, uh, and economy, markets, financial uh, development and sustenance. The challenge to design sustainable, livable cities is to move away from conventional top-down approaches to urban planning to incorporate more participatory and inclusive embodied processes in the whole uh, process of decision making. Uh, Stockholm-based urban planner Jonathan Metzger has made this argument, and this was this was uh, it's actually a, it's a small uh, essay that uh, was published in a planning journal and, and seemingly insignificant, but it was a sort of manifesto uh, to bring artists into the planning process. Uh, he says that artist-led activities can function as a powerful vehicle of communication in the planning process. The unique potential of planner-artist collaborations is based on the artistic license that grants the artist a mandate to set the stage for an estrangement that w that of that which is familiar and taken for granted. Thus shifting frames of reference and creating a radical potential for planning in a way that can be very difficult for planners. So Metzger's argument for involving artists in planning uh, may help to open up new possibilities. By shifting frames of reference, artists make the familiar strange, or as the Russian formalist Viktor Sklovsky put it, they practice forms of Ostrani, creating modes of defamiliarization that help to distinguish between poetic and ordinary speech. For Sklovsky, the purpose of art is to impart the sensation of things as they are perceived and not as they are known. The technique of art is to make objects unfamiliar, to make forms difficult, to increase the difficulty and length of perception because the process of perception is an aesthetic end in itself. 
end of quote. It's expressly through forms of defamiliarization that old habits are unmoored and alternative approaches can be rethought. So Metzger is clearly inspired by the Dutch architect Rem Koolhaas uh, in his manifesto, What is Urbanism, which was published in 1994, who also advocates a certain lightness be brought to urbanism. He asked designers and architects to relinquish fantasies of order and omnipotence and proposes the staging of uncertainty and the irrigation of territories with potential, enabling fields that accommodate processes that refuse to be crystallized into definitive form. Um, instead, he says, Urbanism needs to lighten up to become a gay science, light urbanism. And it's worth underlining that Nietzsche's The Gay Science was his most joyful, cheerful, and serious book. It was referencing the Provençal Gay Saber, the song art of medieval troubadours who spread poetry throughout Europe. So Gross advocates that feminism break of its conceptual impasse by embracing questions of emergence and difference, by opening out to an ontological orientation that decenters the human. Feminist theory has the potential to make us become more than ourselves in a way to make us become unrecognizable, to make us become strange. So with these ideas, I want to turn to uh, think about uh, a number of, of exhibitions that uh, that make the familiar strange. So I want to start with, uh, with the public access collective that I've been involved with for a number of years uh, since the late 80s. So this was our first exhibition in 1987 called Some Uncertain Signs. And this was the formation of the public access collective, a very uh, young group. It's 1987. I was part of it. Uh, graduate students and artists and curators. Uh, so this was essentially uh, bringing art into, uh, into an electronic billboard sign on Yonge Street. This was the follow-up project the following year called Lunatic of One Idea, which was a 36 monitor video wall that what had just been established in Square One, Mississauga. And uh, we invited uh, 17 artists to produce projects for, for this idea, for this idea, for the lunatic of one idea. Here's John Grayson's The Ads Epidemic, before Eldon Garnett's Emergency. There is also um, a piece by Christoph uh, Widichko on shopaholism. So what, what's, it's, goes on, it's a, an actual survey of shopaholism and it's an image of a woman eating, eating her shoe. As an um, so what was interesting it, with, these, with these two uh, projects side by side, inhabiting these at new advertising, new at the time, advertising uh, technologies, uh, first of all, the, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, censorship even though people tried to, artists tried to be offensive, the uh, ads epidemic kind of went by with, with no worries. This was censored by the advertisers, by the uh, advertising company, sorry, not the advertiser, the, um, the shopaholism. So uh, the other one that for the electronic billboard sign was Lynn Fernie's uh, Lesbians Fly Air Canada. This was very, very contentious and uh, poor Lynn Fernie had to find a language in order to simply say lesbians fly Air Canada. So it's, it clearly, uh, in a way, the, the time period. But, but both of those pieces, in a sense, uh, uh, I wouldn't say attack, but spoke to capitalist modes of produ production. So those were the two that were somehow a, a kind of a threat. Um, so I guess, though, the point I really want to make about these exhibitions uh, was that they were, first of all, mirroring other exhibitions uh, that were going on in London and New York. And we had a lot of the same artists that were in our exhibition, artists like Barbara Kruger and Jenny Holzer, Victor Bergen, Laura Mulvey, as well as a number of uh, Toronto artists like Eldon Garnett and Lynn Fernie and John uh, Grayson. 
Um, and so it was, it was a real uh, intervention into the advertising context. The only thing about these projects, and there were other projects that followed, there was a project uh, in Union Station, there were projects on uh, elevator monitors in the financial district that were, that this was the first time uh, in the early 90s that these monitors were being put into elevators, and so we produced a series of projects uh, there, um, is, is that we were really, uh, it was really a, a parasitic relationship to the public sphere. Uh, we were not that interested in the public. We were really interested in inhabiting the space itself. And we felt that these were successful projects, but it never occurred to us to really even think about the public, the public response. And I think that was a shift for us in our curatorial practice uh, uh, that, that happened in the year 2000 with an exhibition called Being on Time that was uh, staged, it was a site-specific exhibition that wasn't staged on a piece of technology uh, as the other ones were, but, but actually staged in a place. And it was funded through a Millennium Arts Council grant uh, to develop new audiences for art. And so we decided that we would engage with, uh, with teenagers at a high school and to bring, we brought eight artists into the high school to uh, not just work with the students, but actually uh, produce uh, these uh, site-specific pieces in the architecture of the, of the school, and then to create a pedagogical kind of situation through the inhabitation. So, so the shift is really, there, there is a shift into much more of a relational engagement with the public, a conversation, and using art not simply as a, a hermetically sealed thing, or uh, or the art world as something that we belong to, but our audience didn't need to belong to. Um, so just uh, quickly, uh, this was a piece, I don't know if you can see it, by uh, Kelly Mark. Uh, this is almost an anti-relational project, and uh, so I, I sort of see it as, as a kind of uh, landmark. She staged a series of, uh, she choreographed a series of gestures uh, every day for a month outside of the school for uh, approximately 15 minutes. And what she would, she would just have uh, headphones that would direct exactly, specifically her gestures, which was sip of coffee, cigarette, open book, look right, look left. And, uh, and that, that itself was videotaped and then that formed uh, the basis for an a seven channel installation. So I talked to her recently about it because I'm very interested in the, you know, the, the theme of the exhibition was time and temporality. And I was interested in the way that she saw temporality. And in my narrative of this piece, the students eventually became aware of her and started to talk to her about what she was doing. But she said, no, actually, no, they, nobody noticed. And it went on for a month. So what you have with the videos is a lot t time going on around her, but she is actually remaining the same. So it is actually not no relation. It's a total disjunction between her own gestures and I guess her own sense of outsiderism um, and and the and the student population. And she's performed this this uh, this series, this this choreography in various public spaces throughout Toronto, and it's called Hiccup. So it's, this, is, this is hiccup number one. John Grayson, um, who, was, who I've worked with on, on a number of exhibitions, was in Being on Time. And uh, he, was, what, what he did a number of different projects with the students, but one of them was to find all of the uh, homophobic slurs that are, of course, part of the architecture of any good high school. Uh, and Central Technical is an art school, but it's also a, a technical school. And so with a group of students, they uh, performed a, um, they, they created an installation. Uh, and Michael Snow, and we were, we wanted to curate different ages as well with the artists. So, you know, Kelly Mark was very young at that point, just an emerging artist, and Michael Snow, a seasoned veteran. And he went, he produced a piece, uh, in the, in the teacher's lounge uh, with an LCD monitor and a ticket taker and had, there were instructions on the wall inviting students to come in, take a ticket, sit down and wait for their number to be called. 
And, um, but the trick was it was an algorithm in which certain numbers never get called. And so some students got their numbers called right away and you know, some students didn't. So it was very, uh, very playful. So I, I, I like this, uh, as I said, I like this exhibition. It was uh, not really well uh, received, I would say, within the Toronto. It was kind of ignored. As soon as you say you're doing something in a high school within the art world, it's really dismissed immediately. It's like, it's high school. It's not, not that interesting. But interestingly, uh, Akwi Enwazor, who was in the process of curating Documenta 11, uh, was visiting Toronto at the time and visited the exhibition and did a tour. And so he gave us his seal of approval that for him, um, this is actually going to be the way that art, uh, contemporary art is, gonna, is going to unfold because artists need to engage with the world. And for those of you that are not familiar with it, Documenta 11 was a landmark break in the history of these, this, this art. Uh, contemporary art festival that takes place in Castle um, every four or five years, every five years, uh, because what he did is he simply expanded the space of the exhibition to, uh, to different parts of Africa, Latin America, uh, Asia, and had numerous, numerous events going on as well as uh, relational uh, projects. The other thing that I, I just wanted to just just to situate our time period um, is the development of relational aesthetics in the, uh, in the late 90s. That's, I mean, it was, it's been going on for a long time, but that's really where it enters the discourse. So, of course, there is Documenta 11. There were also a, a series of platforms and publications going on. So there's a shift. And the fact that the Canada Council produced for the Millennium Grant, a grant focused on cultivating new artists and new conversations and new uses for artistic uh, production, I think was significant. So the development of relational aesthetics uh, as a growing tendency amongst contemporary artists was underscored by the French art critic Nicolas Bourriot in his uh, very famous book now, Esthétique Relationnelle, Relational Aesthetics of 98. Bourriot defined relational art as a new method in the production of art, a set of artistic practices which take as their theoretical and practical point of departure the whole of human relations in their social context rather than an independent and private space. For Bourriot, the role of the artist was changing from being the central source of the artwork to being a catalyst or collaborator in the process of making artwork which comes into being through the exchange of ideas. Such collaborative art strategies had already uh, emerged through experimental approaches to art making since the 60s in North America. Before Bourdieu coined the term relational art, which, which has been contentious, but is nevertheless, I think, really been a very useful term, feminist performance artist Suzanne Lacey had described a new genre uh, in her 1995 book, Mapping the Terrain, New Genre of Public Art. For the past three decades or so, she writes, visual artists of varying backgrounds and perspectives have been working in a manner that resembles political and social activity but is distinguished by its aesthetic sensibility, dealing with some of the most profound issues of our time, toxic waste, race relations, homelessness, aging, gang warfare, and cultural identity. A group of visual artists has developed distinct models for art whose public strategies of engagement are an important part of its aesthetic language. The source of the artwork structure is not exclusive visual or political information, but rather an internal necessity perceived by artists in, uh, in collaboration. And Lacey really uh, is clear to situate this in terms of a feminist approach to art making and art practices. Of central importance to this new genre is site specificity, the location of the artwork and its relationship to an audience or community. While site-specific works have a history uh, in, in Canada and the US dating back to the 60s and 70s minimalist art and land art critiques of art institutions, Lacey directs our attention to new emerging models of public art which seek to give community a role in the production of art. 
around the same time as Lacey was describing this terrain, architect and curating, curator Miwon Kwan's 1997 essay, One Place After Another, which was her dissertation at Princeton and that later became a book, uh, offers a historically grounded vocabulary for discerning different models of public art and community engagement. And, and it, you'll notice now in every review of site-specific art exhibitions, uh, Kwan is the, is the go-to person. And it, it is essentially because her book is, is incredibly useful for, for creating a kind of taxonomy for distinguishing different approaches to public art. Kwan's readings of different site-specific projects in the early 1990s takes as a central focus community engagement and develops a political framework for situating and evaluating their contributions. How are communities addressed, formed, strengthened, or expanded through relational site-specific art exhibitions? What is the role of the artist in these situations? How are collaborations acknowledged? How do they continue after the exhibition closes? These are important questions for curators and artists who take the multifaceted relationship between location and identity as central components in the creation of place-based exhibitions. Moreover, Kwan notes in the era of late capitalism and with the growth of diasporic cultures around the world, such relationships are increasingly complex and uneven. The deterioration of site has produced liberatory effects displacing the strictures of fixed place-bound identities with the fluidity of a migratory model, introducing the possibilities for the production of multiple identities, allegiances, and meanings based not on normative conformities, but on the non-rational convergences forged by chance encounters and circumstances. But she says that despite the fact that place itself is becoming more uh, complex and relations to place are becoming more complex. Place-based identities continue to uh, have a tremendous uh, amount of power. She says, as a comp compensatory fantasy in response to the intensification of fragmentation and alienation wrought by a mobilized market economy or some deeper phenomenological attachment, in the end, contemporary spatial experiences may well be defined by tensions between mobility and site specificity. I'm trying to set up the, uh, the conversation that I want to have uh, around landslide, which is uh, a place that is uh, a, a diasporic city, essentially, and, and people's relationship to that place is diverse, from old timers that have been there, that were bo born there, to, to newly arrived immigrants. It's a very different attachment and interpretation uh, of place that we, that we were engaging with. But before, uh, before I get to that, I just, just want to talk about uh, the next project that I was involved with, which was the Leona Drive project, was a uh, site-specific uh, exhibition that was, um, that was uh, staged in uh, Willowdale, Ontario. And, uh, you know, this really grew out of wanting to engage with new processes of urbanization in the context of climate change. So, in terms of my own work on cities, I have become increasingly interested in the edge of cities because that is essentially where you can see how cities are evolving and developing and the, the kinds of uh, transformations uh, and uh, developments that are essentially eating, gobbling up the land. And that's less obvious. Uh, and the processes of development are less obvious in the downtown core. And so, but if you go right to the edge, you can really see how um, decisions are, are being made. So this was the beginning of trying to think about the edge uh, of the city of Toronto. But of course, I was in Willowdale near York University on the subway. So uh, people were like, yeah, you're not really going into this. <laughs> it's not true. So uh, Willowdale uh, was... Uh, uh, a suburb, and it's, it's actually, it's an inner suburb that is undergoing tremendous tr transformation. And uh, I was working with a group of uh, doctoral students who were also practicing artists and, 
And uh, we began to do, uh, use psychogeographic methodologies and walk through uh, and in and around Willowdale. One of the uh, students on the project grew up in Willowdale, so he designed these walks for us. And we, uh, we started to notice that uh, you would turn down streets, there would be entire streets that were boarded up because developers had simply bought up an entire street in order to make way for a new development. And uh, these, these boarded up houses, as we talked to some of the people in the area, would, would be there for you know, upwards of seven, eight years while the developers waited for their zoning applications to come through. So we thought this would be a fantastic uh, place to stage an exhibition on uh, the, the future or the present of, uh, of development in the area. And we were very lucky to have uh, encountered a municipal councillor, John Fillion, who was sympathetic. He actually had no idea what we were talking about, uh, staging a, a site-specific exhibition in a series of five uh, vacant bungalows. But he, he went ahead with us and uh, introduced us to a developer who, um, who really didn't know what we were talking about at all. But I did, we were planning that as the exhibition was developing, even before we had the houses, we uh, were planning to work with the high school because that is, I, I had learned that with uh, Central Tech is that high schools are, are important places, not only because it's the youth, uh, but the, this is uh, networks of families. Uh, that are from a particular area. And so we wanted to collaborate uh, with uh, Claude Watson School of the Arts. And so all the developer heard when we talked about an art exhibition was just the high school, and it's a high school project. And so, so he gave us access to, uh, to these houses uh, on Leona Drive. And uh, so working with, with a group of people a group of people, a group of uh, artists and uh, uh, doctoral students. We started to do research on these sort of anonymous histories. And we're very inspired by uh, Gideon's approach to history and this, this uh, materialist approach to really treat, treat history, treat the houses in an organic way. So uh, a number of artists went to the municipal library and dug up old photographs and uh, planning documents and the development itself was very old so we had those documents uh, but other artists went uh, down into the basement of, uh, of, of some of the houses and dug, actually dug up materials um, in, those, in those houses. So this is one project uh, that was based on, we started to, this unfolded like a novel it was, uh, you know, we sort of felt in looking at this row of houses that they were completely dead and boarded up. But as we started to engage with them, physically engage with them, going down into the basement, pulling things out, pulling artifacts out, and then talking to people, the houses themselves uh, got activated. They became alive. And all of the networks of relationships that live in these uh, spaces started to inform the way that the exhibition would unfold. Uh, so one of the projects was uh, called Dear Ruth, and it was based on this woman that lived in number nine, that's number nine there, had lived there for 40 years, had died on the dance floor, and um, had left all of her things in the house. She died suddenly, and her house then got sold to a developer and that's why her things were still um, in the house. So, so this was called Dear Ruth. The things that were in the house were things like tax returns, diaries, school, uh, school uh, yearbook, photographs, uh, recipe book, um, macrame plant holders, that, you know, chichkas, these kinds of things. So they uh, made a piece in the kitchen, kind of cabinet of curiosities uh, that, um, can you see that? That's oh, hard to see. Um, th th it's essentially, it's a recipe. Uh, they, they went into her, these are some of her things, but they, they went into her recipe book and they made her tuna casserole. And so they, the, the sink itself is the making and eating of the tuna casserole and then the cleaning of the dishes, and that's on a loop. Now, 
why would they have to make her tuna casserole? Sort of like method acting or something. They, they just had to enter into the structure of feeling of this Ruth Gillespie who, um, who was unknown to us at the time. This is, uh, this is a piece by Richard Fung, uh, and it, it's simply, I think it's just called Betty. And Richard Fung uh, is a Toronto artist. His grandmother lived in the area, and uh, so he was able to connect with these women who had grow, uh, raised their kids in the area, uh, who lived in the nearby condos. And so, and they met regularly for coffee. And so, uh, Richard just became involved with this coffee clutch called the Originals. And uh, his his piece just ended up being this uh, very long interview with Betty, talking about just the experience of um, of of living in the area. So, as I said, other people, uh, you know, dug out old maps and. Uh, uh, photographs. There was somebody that lived in the area that had photographed that whole area o over a period of 40 years, which you can imagine has gone through tremendous transformation. And so the photographs were spread uh, throughout the um, the exhibition. Uh, the uh, Stephen Logan and Voyana Vedekunik uh, were uh, two artists who were not satisfied with simply having maps or photographs. They brought in a channeler. Uh, psychic channeler t into one of the houses in order to channel uh, Ruth and uh, I didn't do that by the way I you know it's just the weirdness so that ended up being an installation in uh, in the exhibition it was fascinating this we actually didn't uh, we didn't f film but it was it was in our minds throughout the whole exhibition was that she she sensed, uh, she had this sensation of uh, deep feminine pain in the house and, you know, with the children and the pain and being profoundly lonely. And uh, it didn't at all coincide with Ruth Gillespie's biography. I'm going to do the who, it's a very who, who. Anyways, that, that one, one person that lived in the house, there was only one person after Ruth Gillespie named Dmitry Belopolsky. And we found some of his things and a documentary on immigration that he was making. And we kept saying, who is this Dmitry Belopolsky? We did a lot of research and we thought he had been, uh, maybe he had been, uh, I don't know, ejected from the country or killed or something. And uh, the day, the opening of the exhibition, uh, Dmitry Belopolsky came to the exhibition and I saw him and I was like, hey, Dmitry, because I actually knew him because he was one of my students at Ryerson 100 years ago. So it was a very strange, and then his wife was there, and she did talk about having gone through a really difficult time in the house and that feeling of loneliness. So it was all, you know, who knows? This is, you know, part, we were talking about that this morning. These archives are, part of it is open to fiction. We, it's, it invites uh, creative engagement so that you don't know exactly what the, what the past is, but you, you're, you're writing it alongside the material artifacts. Uh, probably the, one of the landmark pieces in the exhibition was Ante Liu's uh, greenhouse. And uh, Ante had discovered that the CMHC houses wore the exact design of the Monopoly houses, the little green houses. And um, you can actually, there, there is a direct relationship uh, between the design of those houses going right back to the game of, uh, of Monopoly. And the uh, developers, the, the deal that we had with them was that we would return the site to its original state. And so uh, for a couple of projects, uh, and I'll only go into this one, we, we couldn't obviously return the site to. And so when I approached the developer about painting this house green, he didn't understand why. I w we would want to paint a house green. And, and so I said, well, you know, it's like the m little Monopoly houses. And then he loved the project. And then they began appropriating this as like an icon for their company, <laughs> photographing themselves in front of it and putting it on their website. So it was, it was too, uh, too successful. But what's, what's interesting, uh, I think what was interesting for us and, 
And I have to mention Michael Prokopow, who is an important uh, uh, co-curator for the exhibition. What was, and he's a, he is a historian. What was interesting for us was uh, the attachment to place. So, you know, the neighborhood totally took over the exhibition. They, people that lived in the neighborhood were doing tours uh, on a regular basis. They were claiming the exhibition as their own. They were even saying it was their idea. It's no problem, but, uh, but, that, but that was wonderful. And then uh, people came from downtown Toronto. You know, cool hipsters didn't mind coming up to Shepherd and Young and com coming through. So it, this, this, what I, I loved about this exhibition was it brought, it was intergenerational, and, um, and it brought a diversity of uh, people and interests together. It was very much focused on the past and a fascination with the past rather than the future. Uh, but nevertheless, it created what uh, some are calling an experimental community, which is what, what art, art, these kinds of art exhibitions, which are event-based and uh, very limited to uh, a tight frame, uh, temporal frame, right? It's, it was, th this was only 10 days, so it brought a lot of people in. We had about 3,500 people, which is pretty incredible. Uh, for something out in, in uh, Willowdale, but it brought a lot of these people together who have absolutely nothing in common besides the exhibition and just started uh, a series of conversations about those houses, about the value of those houses, uh, maybe about the fact that those houses are small and sustainable, about the utopian aspects of those CMHC houses that were essentially built for the veterans coming home from the war and giving people an opportunity uh, to own, to actually own uh, a house. Uh, this project also took place in 2009 at the height, of course, of the economic meltdown. So I've tried to approach developers uh, after that, after this exhibition, because so I figured I now have a track record. I'm trustworthy. And any developer is really going to want to work with me, and absolutely not. They no zero uh, interest. And I think the reason that we were able to work in that site was that the, we had a municipal councillor on our, our side who was advocating for us. But also, in 2009, really, the developer was very worried um, and didn't know whether or not he'd be able to move the houses. So I think he was a little bit desperate for anything, any kind of attention. So the end of the houses is that they, you know, they died. Uh, essentially, and, um, and were replaced with uh, monster houses. So it's, it's a kind of familiar story. But I think what we did is we, uh, we created a pause in the processes of uh, development, right? It, just, just a momentary pause in, in, th in that, that process that often happens, even though there, there's that sign, uh, you know, public consultation come to this meeting. And that was, in fact, ended up being an artist project. Uh, it's, these things happen without any sense of uh, our being able to uh, impact or, or control it. So it was, a, it was a kind of momentary pause, and it did allow people to think about development more critically. But I still, you know, for the next project, I really did want to go out further into the edge of the city. For uh, land, Landslide, I, I wasn't sure about Markham. Uh, but uh, something happened in 2010, which was that two municipal councillors, uh, uh, Aaron Shapiro and uh, Sandra Burke, had put forward a proposal for a food belt in Markham, Ontario, that would curtail development for the next 30 years, concentrate it in one, in one particular area, or should I say curtail sprawl, and protect agricultural lands which in the context of climate change, we, we do need to you know, protect that, that land. And Markham is, as a case study, is, is quite incredible because it is moving uh, out into, uh, into, those, um, into those lands. Now, that, the green belt is there. This is a, an incredible uh, experiment, the 1.8 million acres of protected land that the Ontario government has put in place that is up for review in 2015. Um, so what they have proposed was this, uh, this food belt that would protect the uh, green belt, but also protect the agricultural lands. Anyways, it was devastating. Uh, 
Uh, David Suzuki put out a YouTube video saying Markham is the city of the future. Environmental activists really got involved in it. And what was devastating was that they lost uh, this uh, uh, vote, this motion by one vote, which of course belonged to a developer. So we decided that it would be interesting to try to stage a conversation around these issues uh, of, of future, future uses of land uh, in that area, but also to, to do it in a kind of, within a historical uh, framework. And uh, I did, I, as I said, I, w I approached numerous developers because I had a fantasy of staging the next exhibition in an unfinished subdivision, which if you've ever seen what they look like, they're beautiful, surreal ghost towns with the sewage and the uh, uh, street lamps installed sidewalks paved but no but no houses built yet anyways i thought that would be really good but no nobody nobody returned my calls so i went the other way and uh i i found this heritage village kind of in the middle of the night on my computer and i was like a 25 acre uh historic village with 30 houses in it, so that would be a great site to stage this, this exhibition. So, um, and I was really lucky that the director of the museum was really into the idea. She had just taken over the job. And uh, this was something we were talking about this morning also, is these municipal museums are pretty dead and need to respond in a more active way to the, to the community. So she had just come aboard and was redefining the mandate of the museum in terms of environmental politics. So this was an exhibition that was really up, up her alley, so she was into it. And I was working with Jenny Foster, who's an urban planner at York University, and Chloe Brushwood Rose, who is in the Faculty of Education, to really try to design an exhibition that would take up the issues of urban planning and uh, pedagogy uh, directly and transform the heritage village into a strange space. But you know, it's already a strange space. What can I say? It's, uh, you know, it's, it's in the shape of a village. It's not a real heritage village the way that Black Creek is. There's a consistency with Black Creek. This is, it, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, one of the reviewers of the show said the village already smells like data. It's already very surreal. The houses range from 1820 to, to 1940. Uh, there's a train station in the middle of it. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense, but, but, it's, but it's great. It's a, it's a perfect space for us. So um, uh, we ended up, I started with 10 artists because I thought that would be a manageable size, but then I just, thought it's 25 acres and 30 houses and you know so I tried to create a kind of hypertextual uh, biosphere with 30 different artists that would engage with the site uh, from their own different practices and different uh, perspectives. So we really we gave the the artists a little bit of information about Markham. Markham established as a city in 2012 uh, it, Markham is the most diverse municipality in Canada with over 65% of the population from you know, either East or South Asian uh, descent. Newly, newly arrived immigrants make up something like 20% of the population. So it is a space, as I was saying, and this is in reference back to Kwan's uh, comment about site specificity, uh, it is a space where the attachment to place is complex. Uh, so we wanted to figure out different ways of engaging with that complexity. So how to organize it and organize and wrangle 30, 30 artists was, was somewhat difficult, but the, the, uh, the main theme was the line. It's a fairly simple idea, was to think about the line and the, and the frontier. Because it really is, when you go out to Markham, it really is a line. You can see it. You can see agricultural land. You can see exactly where big box stores are going in. And Markham has an excellent green print plan. Uh, you know, very, very impressive urban planners, uh, radical urban planners, innovative urban planners have been working on the Markham plan. But ultimately, the developers do have a lot of control. 
and the way in which uh, Markham itself is, uh, is unfolding is in the, just the multiplication of these very ugly uh, subdivisions. So, so the, line, the line between past and present, uh, the line uh, between uh, people, the line that the grid that was placed on the land uh, when it was first parsed out, um, the, the, the railway line, uh, different kinds of lines that artists could interpret. So the, the first line that went in as a kind of uh, container for the whole exhibition was uh, an 800, 1800 meter uh, row of, or swirling river of sunflowers that was planted by Glynis Loeb. And the sunflowers, there were 18 different kinds of, of sunflowers that were built up there so that you could follow it around. Of course, the river very much is itself a line, but not, uh, not a straight line. Um, the the uh, archive itself, there are uh, 80,000 artifacts in the archive, and a number of artists work with those artifacts. In particular, uh, Jeff Thomas found seven or eight, eight postcards uh, from the 1920s and 30s of Aboriginal people uh, that were being used to, whose image was being used to actually market the, the railway. Um, and several other artists also engaged in uh, Maria Hupfield uh, was one of the other artists that engaged with the archive, creating felt uh, objects out of the hard objects. So there were different kinds of histories also uh, within uh, with it that, that were sort of added onto the Markham Museum. Of course, the history that's told at a place like the Markham Museum is very linear. It's white settler history. Uh, they're, they're, even though the museum has a lot of Aboriginal artifacts, in fact, there's a, there's a whole story to be told, it was not a story that was being told. Uh, but one of the stories that we ended up telling was, um, was a story by Jenny Suttick, who grew up in Markham in the 1980s. And she ended up producing an anthropology of the teenage girl bedroom. And uh, she, her bedroom uh, at her parents' house, it just nearby the museum, was intact. Um, her parents had never, they hadn't painted her bedroom or anything. And so what she decided to do was simply transplant it into the museum as, you know, you want to see how people live because that's the whole, you know, the whole raison d'etre. Of these, uh, of these places is, is that you can see how people actually lived. And of course, there's a great deal of fiction around that weaving of around how people lived. But this was how, uh, this is how Jenny lived. She also uh, interviewed a number of old timers um, about just growing up in Markham and the kinds of walks they used to like to take. And of course, those walks no longer uh, exist anymore. I'm going to, I think I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go through. Uh, Adrian Blackwell and Jane Hutton produced a piece that really engaged with the land um, and, and worked out the, the, uh, the leveling of the land. This was a house uh, that had been moved to the museum. Most of the houses, or many of the houses that were on the museum site had been moved because of development in the area. Uh, and so what they did is essentially measure the land itself that had been, uh, that had been leveled uh, when the house was moved. And it was, the, the piece itself was a reflection on what happens when uh, development moves into a particular area. Uh, my daughter always asked me why, you know, when we would go out to, to Markham or areas like that, why it's so flat. And it's flat in part because of the leveling itself. It, you know, it just makes it a lot easier to put up houses in a very fast uh, way. And the destruction that happens with the leveling of the land is, is extreme. So there's very, very rich topsoil. Uh, Markham is one of the most agriculturally rich areas in Canada, and so that topsoil can never be replaced once it's taken away. So what's going on uh, in Markham is that tension between economy and uh, ecology. Uh, I think I'm going to just move on. You can just see how different artists interpreted 
the, the idea of the land. This was uh, Frank Habermas, a Dutch architect who worked with pulleys inside one of the Mennonite barns and then created uh, a, a very, very, it doesn't look that uh, dangerous uh, cartography outside of the barn that's being held in place through the pulleys on the inside of the barn. And the didactic for this piece is really this, uh, this local logic has led to this local madness, which is the, the whole sprawl of Markham. And uh, this was a, an incredibly beautiful piece that the minute, the minute the exhibition was over, it came down. It was, it was like five minutes after 12, and it, it, was, uh, it was down. There were architectural projections uh, on the barn, uh, Patricio de Villa, Dave uh, Colangelo, all around Google Maps, and the whole development of the subdivisions projected on the barn, very beautiful at night. Uh, Mark David Hosale produced a series of uh, interactive sculptures that really reflected the Greenbelt uh, outline, but these were his, um, these kind of uh, ecological flock-like structures, and he was very interested in the flock-like mentality. Deirdre Logue uh, produced a piece that was ab about her own subjectivity, kind of being behind the land, uh, behind the line, and kind of thinking about queer subjectivities, and that there were two parts to her piece that inside the house, you can't see, but it was very, uh, very, very uh, oppressive little monitors, and then you would go out into a lovely healing garden and a real connection to plants. Alison Mitchell, uh, the lesbian haunted house, we called it. Um, there was a, uh, it was filled with cobwebs, and there was a handle that was shaking. We don't know why. And the sound of women's voices moaning, either in loving way or uh, absolutely being tortured. We couldn't tell. So, you know, children love this. <laughs> yeah. uh, this was a, a mini uh, robot uh, by uh, Vi uh, Winnipeg artist uh, Greg Wilson that really responded. This was, this was probably the closest to what Elizabeth Gross is talking about in terms of moving outside into the bios, into the land. And so this was almost a piece, of, it was almost a musical instrument that was uh, working, made sounds using moisture and, uh, and the atmosphere. So I'm just gonna end with uh, the labyrinth that was uh, created by Ian Baxter and. And um, it was an unspectacular labyrinth. Uh, my architect friends that came to see it like it's very, it was made out of sod, and uh, but it was there was there was a very beautiful simplicity to it, and it was also a piece that invited you to wander through it, um, and so there were a number of pieces that were in, you know augmented the history uh, that that uh, projected themselves into a future that engaged with with the land, and it created a a a, a very large. Uh, surface uh, platform in which to think about all of these questions. So the exhibition was three weeks. Uh, it went on for three weeks. It was uh, well attended. There were numerous symposia inside it. But as with Leona Drive, I'm not quite sure what the impact is. You know, I'm not sure what, what in fact we changed except that it, it had it, except that it happened and it unfolded and it was, it produced that kind of surreal uh, experience and enabled people to reflect on not just Markham, but really reflect on issues that are going on around the world. So I think, you know, the director has asked me if there's gonna be another landslide. No, I won't do it, but somebody else may. And I think that it, what, what these exhibitions do is begin to create forms pedagogical forms, artistic forms, uh, that enable these kinds of conversations, as we say, experimental communities, to begin to emerge. So I will end there. Thank you very much. What's the relation in terms of art uh, making the familiar strange and possibly or whatever as the principle of operativeness and um, something very similar, which has very different effects of the intent how do you see that in relation to this work? 
this new familiarization and the mechanics and the hover? Yeah, I, th I think they're they're similar. I, uh, I like the idea of the uncanny. The only thing is, is that you know, with these these heritage villages, uh, there's a great article that we happened upon by Alan Gordon on the Ontario heritage villages, and they were all set up in the '60s and '70s to mirror suburban lives. So this does look like a little suburb, and all of the villages look like a little suburb, and they're 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 designed to mimic gendered uh, divisions of labor as well. So the focus is not so much on craft uh, or you know on itinerant labor, which would have been part of uh, the Ontario practices in the 19th century. That that would be so the houses should have had should have had extra bedrooms for that. But they, they what, what he found is that they actually, they, they look very much like, they're just little mirror images. And he says, you know, they essentially were reinforcing that that this is the right way to live by giving that way of life, this urban way of life, a past, <laughs> a kind of mythological past. Um, so, you know, the uncanny to me doesn't work as well as just the, Unfamiliar, uh, just because there is, there is nothing to. It's already it's already uncanny, but I think it's it's the, it's so cliched. It's a it's a cliched okay. image. Maybe it does. Well, I, I, I'm more thinking that in terms of the kinds of experimental community that they they're making strange. It all opens up the possibility of the experience. Again, the uncanny it would seem to be the fact that a potentially traumatic experience would close down or foreclose the possibility of the experimental. Well, I'll, I'll, you know, that's so that's why I was asking, you know, it seems like there's a tipping point tension between the making strange as an opening up a defamiliarization or a collapse into the uncanniness on which repulses or repels. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, there were, you know, there were different, there were very different pieces. And, yeah. and some, you know, some, some were playful and loving. You know, uh, uh, Deirdre uh, Lowe's was was somewhat strange and more difficult, and there was a lot of pain in it, but it was also beautiful and soothing. Uh, but the piece by Duke and Battersby, it was a piece in a log cabin, it's the oldest cabin on site from the 1820s, and what they did was, uh, was uncanny. So I, they took um, Gap mannequins that they bought off of eBay, so little kids, and you know the Gap age is about, it's their tweens, so they're 12, 13 years old. So they got a bunch of those, and they restaged a kind of, uh, you know, slut shaming scene, like an Amanda Todd thing. So there's like kids drinking, there's like iPods, and there's a girl on the bed. We don't know what's happened to her. You know, they made it. They didn't make it too graphic, but clearly something bad has happened. And uh, it's it's a scene where something bad has happened. And people coming into the log cabin were really shocked by that. That, you know, and a number of reviewers hated that piece because they felt they, it didn't engage with the site-specific nature of the exhibition. It was like a cheat, and I felt that it was it was quite a brilliant piece because it did it, it was it was very strange, and for them it was it also had a futuristic uh, aspect to it. One of the one of the young kids was dressed in this cat fur and was like some kind of superhero child or you know there was something going on that we couldn't quite tell. So I would say, you know, a number of us have been talking about writing uh, about the different pieces and that one in particular is very difficult to write about because it that, that was very very jarring. I thought it was it was good. It's I can't so I'm just wondering if you can uh, elaborate a little bit about the pedagogical aspect of your um, book. Because I'm thinking that's your you're mentioning here that, that the new approach of the Nadia, which is more to the, the art aspect of, of uh, connection with children and teaching children, um, whatever they, no matter what you know, they want to teach, they, uh, they encourage them to design, to encourage them to, to uh, draw and, and there's actually um, once a week uh, artists getting, getting, getting together with the, the teachers, uh, elementary teachers and, and day centers. And I was wondering if your work is kind of uh, relate to what they are doing. Uh, I don't, I don't know if it's 
So pedagogical, what do you mean exactly? The pedagogical components, yeah. Well, there, uh, there, there were a number of things that were going on. One was a school in the summer called The Farm. And uh, this was one of, uh, this was a doctoral student at York in environmental communication who uh, created uh, a farm. He, he grew a garden and he worked with a number of artists. This is a lot of artists, a lot, a lot of artists, and not a few artists are into uh, uh, ecological approaches to food and food production. Some are organic farmers and artists, and so we had about six artists living in the area who are, have a practice. And so they came and did workshops with the kids all summer. And that was engaging really with, um, with a, a number of schools in the area uh, and trying to get them to think about bringing agriculture into the curriculum. Right? It's, it, you know, it's interesting it's that we bring it. You know, little elementary school kids grow things, you know, for the fun of it, but it's somehow at the high school level, it's sort of not seen as a, as a necessity. And uh, we wanted to say that this is actually precisely the age where they should think about growing food. So uh, this is Andrew Beeler's project to create the farm on the site, and it's 25 acres, and, uh, and had that going on all summer. He also encouraged the students to plant gardens in their front yard. Which I'm sure that the parents did not appreciate at all. <laughs> and I think there's a bylaw or something like that's putting, uh, you know, a vegetable garden in front. I, I don't know. There was some. There was some particular issue, but it is. There's a whole change in mentality about growing food. I think you can see it coming in with younger artists that are, you know, both have a practice as uh, farming and farmers in some kind of way or organic food production. As a, as a scholar, uh, working with your working with the work you make, I mean, sort of, uh, 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 I don't know, creating theory based on what you're creating yourself. So, um, I'm just wondering how that works. I think I would someday like to find my work valuable enough, my sort of artistic work valuable enough to um, to think about. And I, I hope you think about it. <laughs> um, and, and I think it'd be a really kind of exciting. Uh, way of working through ideas, but w was there a point where you said, you know what, what we're doing, what I'm doing is, 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 um, is, is worth um, writing about, or did the writing come first and then you sort of developed your practice from that? Well, it's, you know, this was partly funded through uh, SHRC uh, Research Creation Grant, and SHRC has now accepted research creation as, as a valid methodology. And that is the creation of a work of art as a means to interrogate uh, a process that can't simply be uh, summarized in a, in a paper, but needs to be actively investigated. And so it really is just in reference to methodologies. I mean, that, that was partly what this, this project, uh, in, in some ways more consciously than the Leona Drive project, this project was set out as a research creation project that took place over three years, and it was in a, a definite collaboration between you know, urban planning, education, and fine arts. And, and the idea was really to create a pedagogical situation or, or experiment uh, with a number of things uh, in order to think about you know, sustainable development, whatever that, whatever that means, or to try to understand a place like Morka. But I see this as it's a process-oriented exhibition. You know, it's not something that is is you know you have an answer at the beginning and you get you know you, you get the uh, you have a you have a question at the beginning you get the answer at the end. It's something that you, that you stage. It's a situation that you create, and you sort of don't know what's going to happen. It's the same with inviting three artists to create site-specific works. You know, you work with proposals uh, and you can refine the proposals. But to some degree, you're banking on them being good artists and committed to the project because, you know, with Leona Drive, we had a number of artists that called it in. And, you know, they, they sort of, those projects just fade into the background. But I would say with this one, uh, what, what happened was the artists uh, began to sort of compete with each other. It's a terrible thing to say, but you can see it going on. And uh, as much as they, none of them really wanted to know what the other one was doing. 
they would find out a little bit. And so it was, uh, it, we, we ended up getting, I feel we got 30 uh, great, great works. But you don't know what you're going to get. Um, and you can't, you, can't, you can't exactly predict it. So it is experimental in nature. It's an investigation. Uh, and we're in the process of creating a catalog and writing an essay. And there were, as I said, symposia throughout. There were, there were two different uh, conferences that were going on. So we're going to collect the papers from that, where artists are going to make statements. So you'll have it all in one book. But still, it, you, you know, it's not just, it isn't just one question. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of situation that's going on. What was so interesting about going to the Shenzhen uh, Biennale was I didn't, you know, we were invited to go, and I had no idea how you would package this exhibition and take it to a Biennale. But we ended up, uh, you know, really, really paring it down to, to some of the projections and then having having artifacts. And we arrived there, and um, there were probably 40 other projects, obviously not identical, but that, are, that were using research creation methodologies, that were using artworks to investigate new approaches to urban planning uh, to, and to engaging with communities. That's, that, that's one of the, the, I think, the major um, uh, impetuses behind these things is ways of engaging with communities. And the thing that I want to add that I, you know, as I said, I think that uh, that last slide just begins to touch on it is the, the more than human. Um, what Sarah, the feminist geographer Sarah Watmore calls that she doesn't want to talk about the post-human, but she wants to talk about the more than human. So not just focused on human settlement, but to think about to think about life outside of you know just human dwelling. And what's this, the last part about landslides? I found myself thinking sort of about the Heritage Village as an, an epitaph for Utopia's past, in a way, and that that I wondered. To the, degree, to the degree to which it actually effectively interacted with the story you told about Markham and the way Suzuki talked about Markham as this ideal for the future of, urban, of the urban landscape that gets defeated by the developer and whether it effectively, the, you feel whether the degree to which it effectively intervened in that conversation. And I'm really struck in, in the through line of your talk of, of the role of the developers of disrupting the sort of uh, utopic intention of a lot of projects uh, for the sake of their vision of the present and they need to interact with the present. So I'm wondering if that played out, if that even makes sense as a question. Okay. Uh, so the, the, you know, the Heritage Village doesn't speak to that many people. It was, uh, it was designed in the early 70s by a local, uh, local historian and who had a fantasy of des designing a Disney park. And so he was bringing in all kinds of rides and amusement kinds of uh, technologies that were later discarded in embarrassment. But he was he was a such a character. And you know, Disney World is also a kind of utopian uh, projection, of course. And so it does have it is it is definitely uh, a utopia, but it's 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 one person's utopia. And then the historical society got involved and they started to create that. And numerous people that are historical devotees in the area got involved in the gardening and restoring heritage gardens. But it really did, it spoke to a small uh, group. And what's, what is so interesting, well, one, so many people in Markham didn't know about it. So it's, it was a very underutilized space. It was, uh, it was, they had elementary school groups, that's it. And uh, two, it's a wedding. It's a place for weddings. And it's primarily Chinese weddings that are there. And I think it's such a weird environment that uh, members of the Chinese community love it because it's just weird. <laughs> so it obviously doesn't speak to them. But for them, it's a way of like, this is like America, wilderness. So it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a real uh, Baudrillardian virtual uh, space. So, um, but I, that, that's why I like the, the Elizabeth Gross, that idea of embodied Utopias, because I think what happened was people came in, artists came in, uh, uh, docents who were working on the exhibition uh, came and began to appropriate it or interpret it in their, their own way. So there was a lot of lines. If you you know if, if you mapped it out, there would be a, a multiple intersecting lines 
uh, of embodied utopias, with the Duke of Battersby being the antithesis of that. It is an absolute rejection of the utopia. There's a, like a, a profound violence right at the center, which is why people really reacted badly to it. it you know, the, it, I mean, you know, critics or scholars or educated people would walk in and go, oh, so, so angry. Um, but the developers, yeah, the developers, you know, at, throughout the, uh, the three years as we were preparing the exhibition, a tower started to get built in the back that you could see from anywhere on the site. And I was like, I must find a way to use that tower in the exhibition. And I tried everything, you know, including the, getting the municipal counselor to contact them, the director to contact them. So there was no way that they were going to be part of the exhibition in any way, shape, or form. But the funny thing is they were so glaringly present that they were. Uh, they ended up being, uh, one of the reviewers said, this is like but the most amazing piece of the exhibition, the most amazing building, is the condo tower that's gone up. As, as a kind of reality, you know, just this phallocentric uh, reality that's coming to bear on, on this, this quite a small little heritage village. Well, thank you very much.